All right, so hello and welcome to uh, a video of uh, a few in the series of Understanding Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. <clears throat> and I do realize this is somewhat of a touchy subject. Often students get out from the uh, lecture, uh, lecture hall wondering what the hell this was about, and they can't figure it out, and they're trying to figure it out. And first of all, I'm going to start with a couple of side notes. First side note is that for the basic biophysics course, uh, for the uh, med students in Debrecen, and you will not really be seeing NMR represented in a big essay question in your exams. You will probably see more along the lines of a, a true or false or a relation analysis question. And this is just based <coughs> on what the head of the division said, uh, uh, Professor Pani, that he would like us to understand the basics of NMR and the inner workings of NMR. <coughs> And the second side note is that I believe that anything can be made simple if broken down. And this is uh, what I've set myself uh, to do. So I'm going to start breaking down NMR for you, and I promise it is possible to uh, simplify it. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about nuclear spins and associated magnetism. I'm going to explain all these phrases, so don't worry about that. I'm going to talk about what a homogeneous magnetic field is and how it affects those spins and what are orientation states. And by orientation states, I also mean spin states. Spin states, I'm just going to put it here as well in case you're going through this presentation again wondering what spin states are. I mean these orientation states. And I promise everything is going to be made simple. Let's get it going. Nuclear spins and associated magnetism. First of all, we all know, or we all should know by now, that electrons have this inherent property to them called spin. And uh, accordingly, nucleotides, which are protons and neutrons, also have spin. This is an inherent property. Let's just say I have a proton here. It has an inherent property called spin. And this is its spin. Let's say it's spinning that way. I'm going to draw the axis around it, around which it spins. And this is the spin my proton has. So a question may arise, and you're wondering, okay, if protons spin and neutrons spin, does that mean that this whole nucleus spins? And the answer is maybe. The answer is maybe, because you need to have a condition. That condition is you need to have an, uh, uneven, an uneven number of uh, protons or an uneven number of neutrons in order to have a spinning nucleus spinning nucleus. And again, a nucleus can spin because its components are spinning. So it only makes sense that a nucleus can spin if all of these guys are spinning. Now the question is, why do I need an uneven, uh, you can say, distribution of these spin states? Because if I have an even, an even state, we maybe have one going this way, one going that way, and these protons are going the other way. And you may, may imagine how these spins may cancel each other out. And even though these respective components are spinning, the nucleus as a whole will not be demonstrating a spin. This is the time to introduce the terminology. A spinning nucleus, you can uh, look at it as a um, nuclear spin, nuclear spin, or um, a net a net spin. This is all addressing the same thing, a net spin, or also a resultant resultant spin. These are all referring to the same thing. So let's consider this helium nuclei that I have here, this helium nuclei, two protons, two neutrons. It does not fulfill this condition. Ergo, we would not expect this nucleus to show us any spin, and it would not. So, fair enough. Let's go on to uh, nitrogen-14. And uh, these are the protons and these are the neutrons. And we can pause this video and count just to make sure that I'm correct. And the uh, nitrogen-14 does fulfill this condition. Uneve uneven amount of protons, uneven amount of neutrons. And it just so happens that we would expect nitrogen-14 to show a spin. And whenever I draw an arrow, you can consider it the direction of the spin, although it's really the axis around which that nucleus will spin. Perfect. And let's just say, um, first of all, let's count a few, a few nuclei that we can expect spin from. There you go. 
we have a little, we have a few more, uh, but uh, these are the ones that I make, I made a point to remember. And hydrogen is really the one that's most abundant in our body, and and in other um, uh, water-based life forms. So this is often used for biological samples. Also, let's just assume that I have my hydrogen. Uh, nucleus here and a hydrogen nucleus here, and this is within a sample, we will often see this, this spin uh, in random directions, in total random directions. There you go. And, and the directions uh, are, are, again, totally random, and they arise from the different environment and, uh, and the forces applicable on this uh, hydrogen nucleus. Something else that we need to discuss after we've understood what nuclear spin is and that we have different nucleotides that have inherent spin and as long as they don't cancel each other out and they fulfill this uh, condition, the nucleus as a whole would have a spin. We can also call it a net spin because the addition is, uh, the, the whole addition is, uh, the net spin is greater than zero. It means that it doesn't cancel out. A nuclear spin or a resultant nuclear spin now let's discuss associate magnetism, which is really, it, it sounds like a very daunting uh, way of saying something rather simple. It's a physical law that whenever you have a charge that is in motion, it would create a magnetic field around it. So let's consider this rule here. Let's consider this. I have this helium, this helium atom, or rather, obviously, uh, we're talking about the nucleus, but there is, it is within an atom. So we have this guy, being that it has a bunch of, or I wouldn't say a bunch of, it has one proton in it, it would have a positive charge. Or we can talk about the nitrogen-14 that is slightly more positive charge here, rather these are the neutrons, but it would, it would be positively charged. So we, we're always going to have a nucleus that is positively charged, always, because there's always going to be at least one proton in it. So this is my positively charged nucleus, and it has spin. So now we know that it has both a charge and motion. And because it has a charge and motion, it would have some sort of electromagnetic, or sorry, a magnetic, a magnetic field associated with it. So it would have a magnetic, ma magnetic field associated with it. So that's basically associated magnetism. So taking a look at this whole subject, what we mean is that we have specific nuclei that due to uh, the properties of the, of the a distribution of nucleotides within them, they may have this phenomenon called a nuclear spin. And that nuclear spin of their respective nuclei will be associated with a magnetic field around it. And it's a very small magnetic field. And being that we're touching on these subjects, I want to go through the minerals real quick and just discuss this part. What nuclei are able to give an NMR signal whose resultant nuclear spin is different from zero? And these are just different uh, nuclei that we can use for NMR spectroscopy. Obviously, we need to use ones that are abundant in uh, biological samples. We're not going to be using lead. <laughs> Perfect. All right, so let's get back. And we're taking the next baby step towards understanding NMR. And now we're going to talk about uh, the effects of a homogeneous magnetic field on nuclear spins and uh, what is going on on here. And this is my biological sample. My biological sample has, let's just stick around, stick with my hydrogen, um, my hydrogen example. We have some uh, different hydrogen nuclei, and they're all spinning, and they're, we can call this a spin vector because they're pointing, it is in fact a vector, they're pointing in random directions, totally at random. Very good. Now, what we need to understand is that Obviously, we already know that they're associated with a small magnetic field. What we need to understand is how a small magnetic field is affected by a big magnetic field. Let's just say I have a small magnetic field here, and I place it in a big magnetic field. Let's just say the big magnetic field is pointing that way. Well, the small magnetic field is going to align itself according to the bigger magnetic field. And if you don't believe me, well, it's... It's easy to think about, uh, let's just think about a magnetized, um, a magnetized needle that's in this little contraption called a compass. And usually when I'm standing, and I usually am standing uh, on the face of the earth, usually in my free time, and I have, and I know the, 
the, uh, the Earth is a big, big magnetic field. And if I uh, put my smaller, my smaller magnetized needle within the uh, realm of that bigger magnetic field, which is Earth, it is going to align and point and point to north and point to north. Just imagine this is a very terribly, uh, very terribly depicted uh, arrow, but my compass will align itself according to the bigger magnetic field it's in. And you can almost uh, kind of see where I'm going with this, but I'm only taking baby steps. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you're not too annoyed by that. Let's just say I have a tube. And this tube is going to help me explain what a homogeneous magnetic field a homogeneous magnetic field is just like in chemistry we have a homogeneous mixture. If I apply a homogeneous magnetic field on this, on this tube, that means that the, the amplitude and the magnetic, and the magnetic moment is going to be the same at any given point in this tube. It is going to be at the same strength and amplitude uh, at any given point, which would mean it would affect all of the components in the tube magnetically the same way. So any small magnetic needles that exist in the tube will be affected in the same way regardless of where they are in the tube. And being that we're taking baby steps, let's keep on going with our baby steps. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when I introduce a homogeneous magnetic field to my sample. Well, what would happen? What would happen is we can see that we have these hydrogen nuclei, just like before, all these are hydrogen. I'm not going to draw all of them, but these are my hydrogen nuclei. And what, what occurred is I can see some are aligning with my magnetic field. Obviously, there's a little bit of an angle here. If this is the direction of the magnetic field, there's a little bit of an angle here, but this is still, still considered being aligned with my magnetic field. This is being aligned. Perfect. Now, I know that I have all these guys that are aligned, but what, what about all the other guys? There's a few more, if you notice, that are aligned against it, perfectly against it. And again, there's a little bit of an angle here, but don't worry about the angle. This is still considered against. So that's, that's kind of bizarre. How, 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 how would that happen? And it just so happens that we do observe an NMR, or whenever we introduce a homogeneous magnetic uh, field, to a population of spinning nuclei, I would observe some aligning with the magnetic field. Again, with a little bit of variation, a little bit here, a little bit here. This is still called width, and some against. And the distribution which the width and against nuclei is distributed is called, and this is, uh, this is good to know, um, according to the Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution distribution. This is a D. Very good. And all I really mean is that the distribution for states of nucleus that are aligned with to states of nucleus that are aligned without is just according to a distribution called the Boltzmann distribution. And all that distribution really means is that we're going to have a few, a few nuclei. And if this is the direction of the a homogeneous magnetic field in this example I'm describing. All of these guys are aligned with it. And uh, this, is, this is the essentials of the Boltzmann distribution. I'm going to have a few in my favorable state because it's always favorable to be with the magnetic field and to be against it. So I'm going to have all of these guys in a favorable, favorable state. And I'm going to have a few that are aligned against in the unfavorable state. That's really what the, the essential of the distribution. <clears throat> and you can also think about the favorable state as the more stable state or the less energetic state or the ground state. These are all somewhat, these are all, I would say these are not incorrect to say, or stable ground state or favorable. It's all, it's all okay to say, favorable. And these are the guys that are actually giving us the reading. Why is that? Well, you can you can already see. You know, we'll talk about it later. First of all, what I want to uh, what I want to mention is that being that these are stable ground, all of these unfavorable guys, uh, they're a little bit higher in this in this depiction, is because they have a little bit more energy. They're a little bit more energetic. Energetic. And it just so happens that uh, the 
stronger the homogeneous magnetic field. The stronger the homogeneous magnetic field is, the more energy these guys are going to have. And we're going to go through that, so don't worry about it. Just think that if this is an energy level here, and I increase the magnetic field, all I'm really doing is I'm pushing these guys up higher in the scale. And it's not super important for understanding uh, 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 NMR, but it's, it's, it's kind of important to answering some of the questions that we'll go through. So if you don't really understand this right now, don't worry. I'll mention this in the next videos. So I mentioned that we have guys that are aligned with, and some of these guys are aligned against, and this is all fine and dandy. What we really want to see here is that if I collect all the vectors in this sample, all the vectors, being that I have more that being that I have more that are aligned with my homogeneous magnetic field, the big vector that I'm going to draw, and uh, the nice thing about physics is you can add vectors up. So if I add, I'm just going to draw these vectors, and I'm going to have one pointing with, and then this is the direction of the homogeneous magnetic field. I have one pointing with, one pointing against. One pointing directly with, the other pointing slightly against, and then I have a bunch that are pointing with. We said we have more that are pointing along the magnetic field. If I add up all these vectors, I'm going to get a vector that is something along this vector, just along the magnetic, the homogeneous magnetic field. That's pretty much it. So you can think of all these vectors, all of these width all these width vectors kind of canceling out the effect that these uh, the smaller population of the against vectors have. And again, if you don't understand this right away, you can either pause, rewind, and go through the explanation, or just wait for the next video where I'm going to really work with, with uh, this idea. Let's get the terminology out of the way. There are different ways of calling these states. And I, uh, they can either be called as orientation states, and by, by these states I mean are they aligned with my field or against my field. And by orientation states, this is interchangeable with the term spin states. Question could be uh, a true or false uh, question may be uh, the uh, orientation of respectable spin states in an NMR. Um, in an NMR sample under a homogeneous magnetic field is uh, more oriented towards the uh, with the magnetic field, which would be correct because most of the population is going to be aligned, its spin state is going to be aligned with the magnetic field as you can see here. And if I'm going too slow, it's only because I'd rather go slower than go faster. So all of these names for the different spin states Describe a situation when you're with the field. When you're, if, this is, if this is the field's direction, you're going with it. So uh, saying with the magnetic field, parallel to the magnetic field, favorable position. You can also say ground, or you can also say, uh, um, what, did we, what did we say here? Ground state stable. You can say all of that. And to describe all of the guys that are going against, and they're swimming against the stream, against the magnetic field, against magnetic field, anti-parallel, unfavorable. This is all correct. So just uh, in, case, in case you're not solid on what was, uh, what was reviewed in this video, take your time, take it in, maybe uh, review this video again. What you really should know is that nucle uh, nuclear, uh, there is such a property as nuclear spin that arises from the individual spins of nucleotides in the uh, in the nucleus, they are associated with a magnetic moment. That if we put that small magnetic moment in a homogeneous, big, forceful magnetic field, we can align it either with or against, and we're going to have more of the spin states aligned with the um, the magnetic field. And if I collect all the vectors from all the spin states, I would get a vector that is basically aligned with my homogeneous magnetic field. Hopefully you found this helpful and I will see you in the next video about it.